Welcome, I'm Matthew Phelps, co-author of the Turning to God's Word Bible Study, The Letter to the Hebrews, an explanation of the mechanism of our salvation. Today we'll be talking about Lesson 23, which covers the second book of Maccabees, chapter 4, verses 1 through 22. This is the final lesson in our examination of the Old Testament foundations of the priesthood, and also the latest of the historical books of the Old Testament, and so a bridge between the Old Testament and the time of Jesus. Uh, reading from the book of the Maccabees, we'll be building on the divisions we saw in Jewish society following the return under Ezra, this priest scribe, where we saw the emergence not only of a priesthood as a ruling class, but also as an educated legal class. Uh, and today's exploration of the second book of Maccabees, we will look at what happens to the priesthood to further discredit them under influences from Greek society, and then we'll talk just a little bit about how some of this contributes after this time and develops a little bit toward the time of Jesus, uh, just to lay some framework there. The previously mentioned Simon, who had informed about the money against his country, slandered Onias, saying that it was he who had incited Heliodorus and had been the real cause of the misfortune. He dared to designate as a plotter against the government the man who was the benefactor of the city, the protector of his fellow countrymen, and a zealot for the laws, when his hatred progressed to such a degree that even murderers were committed by one of Simon's appointed agents, Onius recognized that the rivalry was serious and that Apollonius, the son of Menesius, the governor of Coalirsia, and Phoenicia, was intensifying the malice of Simon. So he betook himself to the king, not accusing his fellow citizens, but having in view the welfare, both public and private, of all the people. For he saw that without the king's attention, public affairs could not again reach a peaceful settlement, and that Simon would not stop his folly. So what's going on here? We have a high priest, Onius, who is a good, God-fearing man who's following the Lord and encouraging others to do so. And then we have Simon, who is also in a position of authority, who has decided that he doesn't like having somebody in the way who insists on wanting to follow God. And so he's trying to discredit and to oust him. So far to ill effect, but he is certainly applying a great deal of pressure. When Seleucus died and Antiochus, who was called Epiphanes, succeeded to the kingdom, Jason, the brother of Onias, obtained the high priesthood by corruption, promising the king in an interview 360 talents of silver and from another source of revenue 80 talents. In addition to this, he promised to pay 150 more if permission were given to establish by his authority a gymnasium and a body of youth for it and to enroll the men of Jerusalem as cities, citizens of Antioch. When the king assented and Jason came to office, he had once shifted his countrymen over to the Greek way of life. He set aside the existing royal concessions to the Jews, secured, secured through John, the father of Elpolemius, who went on the mission to establish friendship and alliance with the Romans. And he destroyed the lawful ways of living and introduced new customs contrary to the law. For with alacrity he founded the gymnasium right under the citadel, and he induced the noblest of the young men to wear the Greek hat. There was such an extreme of Hellenization and increase in the adoption of foreign ways because of the surpassing wickedness of Jason, who was ungodly and no high priest, that the priests were no longer intent upon their service at the altar. Despising the sanctuary and neglecting the sacrifices, they hastened to take part in the unlawful proceedings in the wrestling arena after the call to the discus, disdaining the honors and prizes, disdaining the honors prized by their fathers, and putting the highest value upon Greek forms of prestige. For this reason, heavy disaster overtook them, and those whose ways of living they admired and wished to imitate completely became their enemies and punished them. For it is no light thing to show a reverence to the divine laws, a fact which later events will make clear. So, what's happening here? A few things. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we have, in an interesting way, uh, the priesthood, the high priesthood is bought from the king. So we can see 
this is not the king of Jerusalem. This is the king of the region. Uh, we see that by now the Jews no longer had the authority to appoint their own high priests, but that the high priests were being appointed for them, uh, which leads, of course, to the possibility of corruption. And here the high priesthood is bought uh, via corruption. And quickly following that, somebody who nobody of the faithful Jews would ever want to have be high priest begins abandoning all of the religious practices and the laws of the Jews and instead encouraging the Jews to become Hellenized, to follow the Greek way of life and to abandon service of God, um, which is a big deal. Uh, the priests who should be looking out for the best interest of the people are abandoning that particular charge and are instead leading the people astray. Um, and we've seen throughout the Old Testament that nothing good happens as a result of that. When the quadrennial games were being held at Tyre and the king was present, the vile Jason sent envoys, chosen as being Antiochian citizens from Jerusalem, to carry 300 silver drachmas for the sacrifice to Hercules. Those who carried the money, however, thought best not to use it for sacrifice because that was inappropriate, but to expend it for another purpose. So this money was intended by the sender for the sacrifice to Hercules, but by the decision of the carriers it was applied to the construction of triremes. When Apollonius, the son of Menestheus, was sent to Egypt for the coronation of Philometor as king, Antiochus learned that Philometor had become hostile to his government, and he took measures for his own security. Therefore, upon arriving at Chapa, he proceeded to Jerusalem. He was welcomed magnificently by Jason and the city, and ushered in with a blaze of torches and with shouts. Then he marched into Phoenicia. So, not only is this high priest corrupting all of the youth and the priests and the people of Jerusalem, now he's also designating a large sum of money for sacrifice to Hercules. Who? Not the God of Israel, to Hercules. So, what this passage from Maccabees shows us is it's a glimpse, it's a hint of what has happened here at the time of um, the Maccabees leading up to Roman domination of the area, but not, that, not yet there. Um, Wide-scale corruption of the religious practices of the people, specifically led or brought on by the priesthood which leads to pretty large-scale discrediting of the priesthood for a long time uh, and starting to lead to outside influences affecting Jewish culture much more than it had. What this passage doesn't say but is important uh, is that in reaction to this, some people who still wanted to follow the Jewish law ran away out into the desert and followed it very conservatively. The Maccabees led that movement and some of these people became known as the community that was called Essenes. Uh, and some of them eventually made it back into Jerusalem as some of these corrupting influences were kicked out and gained power based on their conservative idea of following the laws. And it's from that conservative section that the Pharisees ar arise. So those would be Pharisees. Then you have Sadducees, which are the priests who the reason that the Pharisees are allowed to take such power is because the Sadducees, the priests, are not known at that time for necessarily being able to adhere, adhere strictly to the law. And so they're again there because nobody else can offer sacrifices. The priests can never be totally kicked out of power because by the law that everyone wants to follow, they're the only ones who can offer sacrifices to the Lord. And it is a genetic, it is an inherited thing. You can't make more priests from your people. So you're stuck with the priests no matter what. But note that as you read the Gospels, the people driving most of what's happening are not the Sadducees. They're not the pre or the priests, uh, but they are the Pharisees or the Pharisees. So not all of the Sadducees are necessarily priests, but they're much more likely to be priests. They're not the conservative legal class. They're kind of the old traditionalist sort of. Hey, yeah, the things have been like that, and hey, we have power because we're priests. Uh, not because we're, the Pharisees are the ones who came in and said, no, we needed uh, all these laws. The strict legalism at the time of Jesus was a result of the influence of the Pharisees. 
And then you still had people living out in the desert as well, trying to practice the law of the Essenes. Uh, John the Baptist and potentially even Jesus' family came from that group of people as well. So you have a lot of competing groups for religious power. Basically, as the people in religious power failed to do what God had asked and what the people were expecting, they progressively were weakened until at some point there was a call, an ability for another conservative class to come in and to say, hey, yeah, or another strict legal class to come in and say, hey, yeah, you know, we need to follow that law stuff. And it all goes back to the distinctions between priests and scribes that entered their society through the return of the people with Ezra. And so we see, leading up to Jesus and even after, pretty constant interplay between people who gain their power from the law and people who gain their power inherited through the priesthood or by being Levites. And in the time of Jesus, Jesus gets caught kind in the, of in the middle of that. He's not a priest and he's not as conservative about the law or as strict about the law as the Pharisees, uh, but he is a religious authority. So he gets caught in the middle and no one knows quite what to do with him. Uh, he's much more closely aligned with the Zealots, but another conservative group. But of course, he's not that either. Jesus is very hard to categorize. And so he gets in trouble with everyone. Uh, and Jesus, of course, is a priest in a different sense uh, as well. Uh, his priesthood is not the priesthood of any of the people we've seen exactly. He Borrow, he certainly borrows priesthood from the order of Melchizedek, as we saw. He's a priest king, not unlike what David was. He certainly is an expert on the law and even creates the law, not unlike Ezra. Um, and he, he fulfills, he also offers sacrifices uh, himself uh, as the prescribed priesthood of Aaron. Um, so he fulfills parts of all of the priestly functions, but none of the priestly classes really know what to do with him because he's not exactly any of them. This has been a summary of our final lesson of our Bible study, the letter to the Hebrews, an explanation of the mechanism of our salvation. Um, we've examined the entirety of the letter to the Hebrews, as well as laying foundations, Old Testament foundations for the priesthood leading up to Jesus Christ. Uh, for information about our other studies, please do look at turningtogodsword.com. We have a no number of other studies available and a large number of free resources available for personal Bible study on our website as well.